Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks for joining us on the show. Um, hello, audience. Uh, welcome to another series of a podcast. I'm Jace. And I'm this Sunny. is Yeah. So welcome to the Freelance Exchange, where every week we will speak to different freelancers um, to understand more about their freelance career and, of course, you know, the gig economy. And today, we are very, very honoured and very fortunate to have Kevin. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. So, um, well, maybe I'll let Kevin introduce a bit about himself. Yeah. Okay, do you want the condensed version or the long version? Yeah. The long version. <laughs> All right, okay. So I started off as a photographer, as you guys know. So uh, my forte was always celebrities and personalities, right? So um, always part of that freelancer gig economy, but eventually realized that uh, I could provide more value because I started off in the celebrity field. Ever since I got back to Asia, people and big companies have been asking me to book celebrities. Right, so the first few I kind of did for free, and after a while I was like, "Why am I, why am I working for free?" Right, mm. so all of a sudden, uh, we I started a, an agency that we connect brands in Asia with international celebrity for branding and marketing purposes. Right, so I think that's when the concept of providing value to clients really kicked in because mm. we're not. It's you could either see it as a skill set as you're just booking talent, or you could see it as you're helping companies grow in value or expand into new markets. Mm. All of a sudden, when you realize that you can increase the market share or growth or reach of a company, then what is your time worth? Mm. Right? So moving forward in uh, both in work and you know personal philosophy, I'm always looking at that value that you can provide clients. So now that we've kind of understand that model, uh, between helping different clients and even developing our own internal like portfolio companies, we are using that philosophy. Mm-hmm. And ever since we've done that, um, a lot of clients have have are attaching themselves to us because we're not just an agency retainer model where we kind of work for you. We we have skin in the game. We come in and help them grow, but we are attaching themselves as a partner, and we grow together. I think that's the biggest uh, change that I've had in, you know, the, the freelance model so far. Yeah. Right. Wow. That's interesting. So, um, Kevin, you started out as a freelance photographer and not in Singapore, right? In in the US. That's right. So I started off in LA and New York, uh, but started working internationally fairly quickly. So thankfully, I've had the, I've seen business models and seen how different people work around the world. Um, I think the U.S. model is definitely a little bit more aggressive because markets are so big. You have to be a little bit more aggressive. Ever since I got back to Asia, people have actually been telling me to like calm down because <laughs> maybe Asian business models are a little bit you know, more conservative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm kind of learning the blend of both because culture is very important as well. So you don't want to overdo things. It has to be sort of uh, be a match to the market as well. Yeah. Well, I guess a lot of freelancers in Singapore may have the question like, you know, Singapore is too small, they want to venture out. But, you know, how do they make their first move? Right. But you know what? I don't believe that anymore. I mean, the world is getting smaller with social media, with a lot of like online different platforms. You don't have to work here in Singapore. Look, look, even a simple program like Fiverr or Freelancer, right? Uh, a client from the US, uh, Russia, could be hiring someone here to be able to handle a, a task. Right, so even on that very basic level, I think that that whole mindset of I'm based in Singapore, I have to work in Singapore, mm-hmm. doesn't really, you know, that's a very old mindset. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we know Kevin for the last since 2015, mm-hmm. right? Since Kevin yeah. started working on our <laughs> SG50 15 project, yeah. <laughs> but by then you're already fairly successful. You know, coming back from the US and yeah. actually um is an entrepreneur that owns several companies, yeah. right? So um between um working as an individuals um and working as a um owner, I would say or rather a creative entre- uh, entrepreneurs, do you, what is the key difference that can actually help? Um, an individual make the transitions um, you know from operating as a single entity into you know an owner of several different properties to me I feel that skill set is very very similar right Mm. the only difference between working for a client and working for yourself is really funding Mm. right because when you work for a client uh, it's easy because you're at least getting some money to sort of get by and pay your bills Whereas working for yourself, if you're developing your own thing, that initial subset of money has to come from somewhere, 
right? So if you're lucky enough to have made money, invest in your own company, that's one thing. Or friends, family put money into your company and then you grow. That's another way of doing it. So um, really both, at the end of the day, I think that's what excites me because it's not about having working for a client or working for your own company. It's really that skill set. If you're excited, you know what you can do and you're just excited to apply it, then really it there's so many different outlets where you can apply yourself right yeah Yeah. so it really is it really just starts from that mindset yeah yeah so having experienced the u.s culture and then now coming back right home in that sense um more asian culture how would you actually compare you know the two different culture that you're you're experiencing and do you think that having a overseas um, exposure experience will help you know have have helped your career so far uh yeah i definitely think so i think any experience that you have can always be internalized and used to your benefit, right? So I think, thankfully, from a very young age, I think from family, uh, dad was in the army, so we got kind of travel around quite a lot. Um, but that proved to have a very open, like, uh, international mindset. But today, I think a lot of people through YouTube, social media, and stuff like that, you can learn. It's just just because, I think maybe you're not as fortunate, you can't travel, doesn't mean you're at a disadvantage. I think the world is becoming so small between media, social media, forums and stuff like that. There are so many learning opportunities. So I think if you say, oh, just because I'm not this, I'm not that, and then you hold their self back, that really is just a story you tell yourself, right? right. But yes, that international or just that, that mindset of, of, of seeing the different markets is very beneficial because... In while you're in the US, you see a lot of companies trying to bridge into Asia because China was the big thing, right? Yeah. And then on once I'm back in Asia, you see something very different because you see the companies in Asia trying to bridge to the US. Yeah. So all of a sudden, both sides are trying to do the same thing. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I see that value of being in the middle. You yeah. facilitate a direction for both yeah. ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that's where essentially that's where my value is because uh, I have businesses in the US and also partners and clients here in the Asia, my job is really try to connect both of them. Mm-hmm. And then as we connect both, is how do we sort of bring value and growth to both sides, yeah. So does, um, do you think that is um, a difference um, for creatives, right, who are actually um, coming from Singapore, right, um, versus, say, creative coming from other part of Asia. Um, how do you compare us in that sense? Do you think um, we have more room to grow um, just because, you know, we come from a place where there seems to be better educations, right. you know, and then uh, we are bilingual, right? Or do you think that the future is actually more in um, the creative craft, not so much in understanding the international way of working, if you, if you get what I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, it's interesting because Singapore is a very, um, how would you say that, education first uh, versus they value education over creativity, right? Unfortunately, creativity can manifest itself in many different ways, even in business, in terms of structuring different business deals, creativity and sort of thinking outside the box is very crucial as well, right? So I think um, previously we talked about a... a accountability model, right? Which which sort of my company adopts. It's just very different from what a lot of companies do. So what we do as an accountability model is we don't just take retainers. We sometimes waive a portion of our retainers for a stake in the back end. So whether it's equity or in terms of sales, right? You can only do that if you're sort of confident in the value that you're providing. Okay, so basically, yes, we may not make as much in the front end, but because if we succeed on the different KPIs uh, in the back end, mm. that's where we benefit. Mm. To clients, they have a partner that they're going to war with instead of just an agency that they're, 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 they're paying, right? Mm. So because of that, right, the, the approach, the working style, all that stuff is very different. And that only comes if you have a sort of a creative way of solving this, this problem. Right. Well, it's because I think with a lot of agencies and a lot of clients, because... Mm. Because of the agency model, whether you sit on your ass or whether you're working, agency doesn't know. And the the our company benefits if we're charging a retainer, right? But if you're using, a, let's say, accountability model, mm. that itself is a creative uh, manifestation of how to handle business. Mm. Um, that's very interesting because all of a sudden now you have vested skin in the game. Mm. 
and agencies like work with you, not as as it is more of a collaborative uh, effort, right? Yeah. So I think this is just one example. In the world, there are so many other ways of sort of looking at mm. this. And if you look at a lot of your your funding deals, your VC deals, your 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 even creative way of solving a, a project, I think Singapore. I think that's what they need to do. Embrace that creative part as well as the education and then have that uh, pair together. You Because mm -hmm. you can't have too much of one side. Right. If you have too much creative, then you get lost in the clouds. Then in the business sense of things, <laughs> it's very hard to proceed, right? Yeah. And if you have too structured in the business side of things, uh, you're too stuck that you won't find creative ways of solving a problem better that you may benefit. Actually, not one side benefits, mm -hmm. both sides benefit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that is the problem Singapore has. Yeah. yeah. But do you think it's very rare for a creative, because you yourself is a, start from a creative, sure. right, a photographer. So for a creative to actually have, you know, um, business-minded mindset, you know, is that something that you learn along the way? Yeah. Or how do you marry? Because we always hear creatives say, I'm a creative, right? Yeah. Don't talk to me about money. I don't know about dollar and cents, yeah. you know, that kind yeah. of that kind of yeah. expression. So so is that something that you learn along the way through the hard way or through the easy way? <laughs> mm, thankfully, I think this this uh, answer, right, yeah. um, was taught to me, I think downloaded to me by like several professionals at a very young age, yeah. right? So I think the what was actually said was there are two types of photographers in this world. And I think when I use photographers, you can be very interchangeable to designers, yeah. architects, a, any other positions, right? Yeah. There are people that are, are very skilled, very talented, but without a business sense and no one knows who they are, yeah. right? Or you could be a mediocre talent, but with a lot of business sense. And funny enough, these are the people that succeed, yeah. right? And uh, like, I don't think I'm the most talented. There are like tons of other people way more talented than, than me, right? But mm. because I, I understood this concept very early, I didn't just focus on the creative. I spent some time reading and understanding the business side of things as well. Mm. So just like what I said, I think having the the balance of both, that's what you really succeed. Mm. Right? That's a very honest statement. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm the most talented, but because I know maybe enough PR that you can take whatever skills you've done and then push it out. At least people know about you. There's no point being the yeah. best at anything and no one has never heard of you. You will never, yeah. yeah. But do you think that mindset is very important to freelancers as well? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That the mindset of having that balance is very important. Or mm -hmm. um, many people have found creative ways of around that, right? So let's say if I'm a creative and I only want to be a creative, mm -hmm. then find a partner that's very good at marketing. Mm -hmm. Because the marketing guy sees you as a product that they can sell mm -hmm. and then you are the, the creative behind the scenes, right? So like I said, you don't have to be, everyone is very different. So having, understanding the creative way of solving it, I think that's the most important thing, mm -hmm. yeah. How have you been, um, uh, how, how do you think that freelancing has changed since, you know, <laughs> like decades ago to now? The freelance market has changed so significantly. I think with the internet, opening it up to being things being very global. Um, based, I mean, company-wise itself, I mean, I'm a creative, I stick up for creatives, but even then, sometimes we find amazing creatives on Fiverr Freelancer. They're doing it at $5, $10, right? And amazing work. I mean, good enough for what we need it to be, mm -hmm. and we're paying 5 or $10, mm -hmm. right? How do you expect someone that's trying to make a living? You know, but a lot of these people are from Russia, India, yeah. where 5 or $10 goes a very long way. That is actually a substantial pay for them, right? Yeah. So even now, we, uh, part of our company, we use a lot of virtual assistants, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Philippines, India, mm -hmm. Russian. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our monthly tab comes up to like 1,000, 2,000. And this is us with a team of four or five people. Mm -hmm. 1,000 doesn't buy you anything here. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that, I think you can either complain about it yeah. or you can figure a way out around it. Yeah, and, and I think the first step is to realize that all this is happening. Mm. If you refuse to believe that all this is happening and you keep on that same path, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm. If you understand this and you can understand, then you can come up with that creative model on how to solve it, right? Mm. So I think, uh, example, so a lot of, um, let's say if you hire teams from Philippines, India, language becomes a problem. Mm. 
So an opportunity would be pro uh, project managers to be inserted that you can use them to, 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 uh, as the working modules, but the front-facing client side, you can always be that front-facing client side, mm. right? Yeah. So I think that is a very creative way, keeping your, your budgets low. Mm. You can come up with the creatives, but a lot of that execution can be done by a lot of outside teams. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, even for us in our creative at works, mm. you know, when we are doing business, right, we are increasingly, we are also seeing a lot of clients are more open now mm. to actually try out new model mm. um, because, you know, with internet, with social media, things are moving so fast. So they don't need the perfectly executed so-called design, yeah. right? They just need one that is fast enough, turn around fast mm. enough that they can actually put it up, you know, the next day. Yeah. So I think this actually changed um, the mindset on a lot of the client side right. as well. They are more open to using, um, I would say, resources like this, you know, um, to, to actually help them to leverage. But of course, on the other flip side, then we hear a lot of the creative freelancers <laughs> in Singapore that were saying, okay. yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so I guess, you know, it's the standard of living in Singapore, unfortunately, that they have to actually um, factor, you know, into their costing and hence, you know, they may seem to be overcharging right. compared compared comparing themselves like, to the I would say the neighbouring countries so on that note right what would you actually advise you know the freelancers who are based in Singapore mm. to actually um, you know manage this better yeah. right um, what do you think will help them to actually provide that kind of value that mm. the client will say okay you know I don't mind paying you more because this is the value I'm getting back mm. right yeah absolutely I, I think that answer is very easy for at least for me right yeah. you can never fight with not skill set, but like price per hour, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of the freelancer mindset at this moment, it's about, you know, uh, you need a picture, I charge 10 hours and then I charge per hour, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's a very old mindset and you can't fight with people in India, a lot of mm -hmm. third world countries, the, the smaller emerging markets, they're definitely going to be cheaper, right? So where I see the value is, is in terms of providing value. Because at the end of the day, mm. clients are, are very result-oriented. Mm. That process, how you get it done, mm. I don't care. Mm. Basically, I just care about the end result. It needs to be obviously of good quality, yeah. right? But then if you take it a step further is this project, what value uh, does it uh, provide the clients? Mm. If you can understand that value, right, then clients, that is where the, the big money comes in. Mm. Because if you can help a client grow their market share by 10%, example, right? And that 10% is $10 million. If you ask for 1% of the back-end equity, they will definitely give it to you. Because if, you, if, if they can make 99%, I'll, def, I'll definitely give you 1% or 10% or whatever you ask for, right? So really, that value is what a lot of the freelancers need to be focusing on. If they can figure out what value they can provide, uh, figure out how they can benefit a company or help the company grow or I mean different companies have uh, various KPIs or, or goals right mm. so I think the first step is li really understanding and listening to what the company's goals are mm. because even from a company standpoint what tends to happen is they are very task oriented so a lot of briefs that we go in it's really I need a picture mm. right if you can uh, a creative can ask why do you need that picture that already starts unlocking. We need this picture because we need to, you know, do a campaign to reach out to 100 million people, for example. Then all of a sudden, that focus shifts. Mm -hmm. If I, as a creative, can figure out how to bring you that 100 million dollars, uh, so 100 million uh, reach, right? Then all of a sudden, my solution and my value increases, mm -hmm. right? Then the, the, the tools that I use now are very different. Right? I can still use the skill sets I'm using, mm. but my solution pro, uh, pitch to the client is very different now. Mm. Right? And obviously, if I can save the client instead of running for 10 different directions at one source, I can do that. What, how if you're a client, how much would you pay me for that? Yeah. Right? Exactly, yeah. And that's, that's something that very few people do nowadays. It's still, I think the freelancing mindset, it's still very task-oriented. Yeah. That's the thing, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and and but increasingly, we are also seeing a lot of the young so-called creative professionals. You know, they try to do everything. Mm. You know, um, but of course, then you know, talking about whether they have a specific craft, right? Um, that is something that become very difficult for them to um, to drill into it. So, for for example, right now with smartphones, everybody can take 
picture mm. and everybody upload to your Instagram, everybody can call themselves a photographer, yeah. right? So for yourself, because, you know, you go through a formal training and then mm. you have, you know, a hard time, you know, well, I would say, I, I think you go through a proper learning procedure, I would right. say, to become a professional photographer. But to this group of young people who come out, you know, without proper training and yet call themselves photographer yeah. or freelance photographer and they started to get jobs and things like that you know how would you advise this group of people yeah. you know right. with the current technology right. yeah um, how do you how would you encourage them to further on improving themselves so that they really become a professional photographer rather than a you know shoot and go right. kind of freelancers I, okay that, that is a very loaded thing okay, so <laughs> I, I'm actually excited at that because I think okay, being a professional photographer right yeah. so a lot of, you're right, a lot of the younger guys, because it used to be as a professional photographer, my, you know, a professional camera would be, you know, thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. A very small subset of people had the ability to become photographers, right? Now, with cell phones, uh, especially, you know, a lot of the campaigns nowadays are digital campaigns, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you don't need a large camera. Sometimes, a, yeah. if you look at a lot of the influencers, a lot of the uh, Instagram, Facebook uh, stuff that's created on phones are amazing, mm. right? So, to a lot of agencies, I really don't need that 30 th I don't care that you have it because at the end of the day, the picture just needs to be good enough. Mm. And the mindset was, previously, when we created campaigns, we spent a lot of money on it because the shelf life for a campaign is six months, 12 months, mm. there's value in it, mm. right? So, a lot of the campaigns nowadays are, sometimes, campaigns are being shot for Insta stories as 24 hours. So if a campaign lasts for 24 hours, why should I spend like hundreds of thousands in it? It just really, the mindset really just needs to be good enough nowadays. And sometimes, and honestly, I've seen some uh, people shooting and for amateurs and younger guys, I'm, I'm even blown away. Mm. So I think photographers that try to come in and compete on price, you can't win, mm -hmm. right? It's very hard. But once again, with that value, it's if you can figure out a way to solve problems or tell stories, Right or tell, be effective in the message, because mm. anyone can shoot a picture. Right, it's very easy. Phone click, yeah. but let's say if I'm selling apparel, right, uh, the basic knowledge or certain skill sets about compositions and leading lines that you still force a viewer to to uh, force a viewer's eye to look at exactly what they want. Those skill sets are still very invaluable. Mm. So although they may be, you know, a million photographers in the world the people that can that have the skill set to control uh, someone's eye, that is a very small skill set, very small subset. Mm. So if uh, a younger photographer wants to learn, those are the key things. Don't forget about technology. Technology will always keep changing and there will always be a lot of uh, comp competitors. But if you are very effective in what you do, uh, instead of a viewer taking 10 seconds to digest a message, if your shot is very clear, you know exactly, and that same message is told effectively in one second, they can tell it, that's where your value comes from, mm. right? Especially in this day and age, your, your attention span, I think the latest count was like three seconds. Mm. People are not going to look at, you know, traditional like pictures for a long while anymore. Yeah. You really have one or two seconds to be able to digest that message nowadays, yeah. right? And more than just... Uh, traditional photography. I think there's many ways of digital storytelling nowadays, mm -hmm. right? So whether it's a still picture or a, a moving visual nowadays, it doesn't cost a company any different to, to post a picture on Instagram. Mm -hmm. A still picture, right? So I think a lot of photographers need to bust out of that, that just a static picture mindset and be able to f embrace the different ways of telling stories as well. Because mm -hmm. a lot of and this is a actual thing nowadays, right? So a lot of, you know, uh, boomerang stories, like yeah. cinema graphs and all this stuff, people use it for fun in, in Instagram and stuff like that. But a lot of the corporates are, are, all, are all looking for similar ways to tell their corporate stories. Mm -hmm. But funny enough, in the, almost the entire market, there's no one creating that professionally. Mm -hmm. Why is that so? Mm -hmm. If a photographer understood this and create that and you're able to tell, tell let's say, corporate or commercial stories using contemporary styles and tools, right? Uh, they have a lot of work. Yeah. They're actually, no one is like catching up to that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But one of the common, I would say, um, 
feedback or comments that we have from freelancers is they have no time for this, right? I mean, um, you know, they they are so because um they are so they are so busy with handling their craft, right. right? So they have no time to monitor the trend, you know, right. uh, how they can change themselves, you know, to actually um, I think, create I think more value. I another way is the, the clients also in yeah. Singapore because yeah. they are not open to that. Sometimes, if, even if we were to, you know, propose to them something different, right. they'll be like, oh, no, 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 let's do this. <laughs> no, but... I think that's where I disagree with you guys. So, so I think we're talking about the craft, right? Yeah. So a lot of these modern day storytelling tools is the craft. It's just an evolution of photography, right? I mean, photography is is traditionally very like still picture mindset, but everyone's kind of, there's no value in still pictures anymore. I mean, there is a value, but there's many other ways. So when you're talking about a craft, a photographer that can understand all these various ways of, so it's not just a sideline thing, that is their, their main craft. And a lot of corporate companies are actually looking for people to, to create this. Yeah, so it's, um, a lot. Okay, I wouldn't say all. I think that the the ones that understand it and get it mm. are because this is effective uh, tools of communication. Mm. They understand it. They have to use modern tools to connect with modern audiences, yeah. right? So the clients that don't get it are stuck in the old world where still photography must be still photography. Yeah. There's no value in just keeping it still anymore. Mm. There's a lot more value in a lot of like digital moving pictures that still tell that same story, but no one is providing that as a service. Mm. So the first photographer that are, actually I'm, a, I'm encouraging a lot of the, the people I've mentored to kind of move into this already because mm. in corporate story, storytelling, whether it's a B2B internal or even external front facing, a lot of people are, a lot of companies are putting this out as a requirement. Mm. But I can tell you very few people are focused on that or yeah, because mm. everyone thinks it's a fun tool why does it have to be a fun tool, mm. right? Mm. And uh, the first person that can kind of have a corporate structure, mm. do it convincingly with a high level of production, but still use these modern day digital tools, that's it. Mm. But these don't get stuck in the, the digital way of storytelling because in two years, all these tools will be old. I'm sure there's going to be a new way of, of tools coming up. Mm. You know what I mean? So that craft, I think, is growing quicker than ever. You know, previously, as a photographer, maybe, yes, new cameras will come up, but the, the mm. basics was always there, yeah. right? But now that growth of technology is growing faster than ever. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. So you mentioned that you also mentor um, young photographers. Um, you have several, running several business, and we also understand, you know, you have a new family members coming <laughs> as well. So how do you actually allocate your time or juggle your time among all those different, you know, life-changing experiences? Be a vampire, don't sleep, yeah. <laughs> No, but really? I think it. I think it really comes down to passion, mm. right? Because it's not just a job for me. I think I'm genuinely excited about all the different things that I do. It's just, you know, people people have many different outlets. Like to me, this is my outlet. I'm genuinely excited when I sit down in front of a computer or with a client. I'm genuinely excited to share. I'm genuinely excited. It's still, if like someone goes drinking and partying and that's their time off, like for me, what gets me excited is this. <laughs> I think to me seeing things being able to create something out of nothing and seeing things materialize that is is, is my biggest kick right. right so whether it's in terms of projects or in terms of companies seeing it succeed I think I'm genuinely excited about this but have you ever suffered a burnout uh, yeah I, uh... I mean I think when I was younger mm. uh, I definitely do that I think now I I'm more aware of it. Like today, I've just been on the go since I haven't had lunch. It's four o'clock. Yeah. Oh no, do you, you want know? us to get you something to <laughs> eat? But you know what? I'm generally excited. I'm generally do this. I mean, so I think because I'm aware of this, I, I kind of have to take care of myself as well. And I think, thankfully, I have people around me that kind of know I, I fall into this phase. So the, my sister would be like, shut up, eat. We're not going to let you move away. So... <laughs> Having people, I think when you look out for people, they kind of look out for you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because I think in the previous mindset where as a photographer, it's it's all about me. You know what I mean? It's like me, my ego. We shoot this person. It's like how I benefit. I look good. But now the thing is, if you can provide value and then provide value for a lot of other people as well, they mm -hmm. value you as well. Okay. I think that's the mindset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the reason what makes you go into photography in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think with photography, that that 
creating something out of nothing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and then having a, a final picture that you can show the world, I think that excites me. And then to to this day, even though I do a little bit more business, uh, and photography is just more of an on demand thing for me, um, I I'm I'm still genuinely excited. Like even for my own life, right? Uh, I would still use every opportunity to create pictures, do it the way I do it. Um, like for we, when my wife found out and I found out we were pregnant. Um, we created a baby announcement picture as well. I'm not sure if you guys saw that. Yeah. So it was a boy and Star Wars is one of my favorite movies. So we did a, you know, a Star Wars theme shoot where the, the announcement was a blue lightsaber, yeah. right? So a lot of that kind of stuff, a lot of people can't really do, but we use the skill sets that I'm good at and we use that for that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I think that still genuinely gets me excited. Right. Yeah. And when you move to US, is that a deliberate decision or is kind of like opportunity just kind of open up and then you decided to, mm. you know, head to the States? Mm. When I moved, when I was about 19 years old, mm. at that point in time, the creative uh, field in Singapore wasn't very developed yet. So I think immediately I also knew that there was a ceiling above. Mm. So if I had stuck down in Singapore, uh, I'm sure things could have moved, but I felt like there was a ceiling. So obviously everyone has to make a decision at some point, right? So my decision was, you know what? I saw a bigger market. I knew I had the drive enough to kind of just go and do it. I didn't know anyone in the US. So really flying there solo was one of the scariest things I could have done as well. Especially when you're like 20, you know, and thankfully I worked a little bit. Thankfully I had parents that were very supportive, right? Because for a good, I would say, 12, 13 years, I hardly saw my, my family, mm. right? And thankfully, not many families um, are okay with that. Thankfully, my family was. And I think that gave me that space to kind of grow, mm. make a lot of failures along the way. And I, it definitely was not an easy, just like, just because I started, I got there. It was yeah. so many different failures that have kind of like hit me along the way. But mm. I think the drive and passion was still, you know what you want to make happen and you still kind of keep going. But how mm. did you find your first client in the US? Mm. A lot of failure, right? So the first clients happen after like, let's say a hundred people turn you down, the hundred and first client that you got, that is your success. So you made a cold call. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I really started, I mean, because it, it would have been so good if my grandfather was connected, like it was easy, <laughs> connected, right? But uh, unfortunately I didn't. It was really just starting from the ground up. And... Mm. I think what was harder also being Asian in the US, mm. right? I think thankfully, maybe because I'm an outgoing person, I just found the right people that can, kind of believed in me as well. So by taking a chance, they kind of benefited, but I also benefited as well. Mm. Yeah. So obviously when I got the chance, you obviously cannot like drop the ball at any chance, right? So it's also about, you know, sometimes you just have to work twice as hard. Yeah. You know, a lot of the shoot prep where... Nowadays, I can close my eyes and go in and maybe take 10 minutes and prep. I'd still be okay. Previously, it was 10 hours worth of preps, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, in case I ran out of ideas during the shoot, I'd have a lot of backups. I printed, researched, mm-hmm. done a lot of stuff. So, at no point of time did I give myself room for failure, yeah. mm-hmm. you know? And mm-hmm. I think when you first start, you kind of have to do a lot of that. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the students uh, that I meet nowadays, the younger generation, I think kind of take things for granted. Or, or, and, and they just don't. They, they think everything is kind of given to them. Yeah. So when they don't, they hit that little bump of failure, mm. they, they kind of give up already. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I think that already is a, a mindset that, that you have to kind of get over. Mm. So at what point in time that you decided, okay, you know, um, I should focus more on building companies instead of continuing my craft, right. you know, to improve my craft as a photographer? Um, I think I do both still, but I think the exciting thing is is creating that value. Creating, I realize where previously I created photographs, mm. right? Then all of a sudden I help companies create companies. Mm. Then all of a sudden it came, the manifestation came to creating my own companies, right? I think that act of creation is still mm. there. Mm. It's just I realized that the only thing that changed is the val- the the size of the value I brought different things. Mm. Right, so as a photographer, it was that value was only me. Maybe the company that hired me, but that was about it, mm. right? So now, when we did the celebrity um, uh, management business, 
when we help companies develop and enter into the new, a new market that is we're bringing value to more people, thousands, mm -hmm. right? Then now all of a sudden when we start our own companies is bring value to maybe the team that we hire, mm -hmm. they, they are fed, they, they grow because of what we've created, mm -hmm. right? And then on top of that is the service offering. As if we go, can we affect more and more people? Can we make people's lives better because we're around? Mm -hmm. I think that to me is my ultimate goal, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why I started from photography where I still love photography, but the drive to, to bring value to a larger subset of people is what keeps me keep going up and up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. inspiring. <laughs> no, but I think, I mean, I guess to me, it all comes from that philosophy as well, right? I think what I did, or what I do is very superficial, both like celebrities, it's very superficial. If, it, if I disappear, no one's going to miss me, right? So I think that position to, if I can create something bigger that impacts a lot of people, so let's say if I go, at least there was value or mark I made on this world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that is what gives me driving because I feel like I haven't done that yet and that's why, and clock is ticking, right? Everyone's kind of getting older, <laughs> so it's that, that drive to keep going and yeah. So now having um, setting out families, you know, or new kids coming along, how has it has it changed your perspective a bit, or oh, yeah. you know, as, as to your passions, you know, and all this? So now are you more into baby products? <laughs> baby products. <laughs> Funny enough, okay. So with the kid, I think the big shift ever since like we found out, it, and maybe even getting older is a shift in priority that you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. I think previously. Um, every opportunity, every like potential, I would kind of jump on, mm. right? But now, getting older, maybe hopefully wiser, mm. it's about prioritizing and realizing you don't have to, even though you can't take every opportunity, mm. you shouldn't. Mm. Because I'm also realizing the concept of um, opportunity uh, loss as well. Right. Yeah. Right. That includes your family time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like so yeah. it really is about prioritizing. So certain things where even now, you know, it's not, it's about making a living, but it's also making a life. Mm. You can't sacrifice making a living so much that you, f that you forget to make a life. Yeah. yeah. So I think as maybe when you're younger as a freelancer, you don't have the, the, the opportunity to think about all these, but mm. at some point you will, mm. you know, and maybe it's just a, a stage of growth for every person. Yeah. Freelancer, yeah. starting out in Singapore. Freelancer. Um, the, definitely the first one is just don't give up. Mm -hmm. Because failure is eminent. You will always hit failure no matter what. And for me, I see a lot of youngsters nowadays, the second they hit failure, they kind of give up. Mm -hmm. But it's not even just like the first hundred times, you know. Like a lot of people, like first time they give up. Like, but failure, in especially in career, happens over and over and over and over again. It's just... Mm -hmm. To me, what was that quote? Success is uh, the enthusiasm to to hit every challenge without losing any enthusiasm, mm -hmm. you know? So to me, is if you can do that, that will eventually lead to success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because why? Because you just refuse to give up at the end of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But just now you mentioned, you know, the reason why you left for the US because you kind of feel like you have hit a her ceiling in that right. sense, right? That was then, right. right? Now, you know, with today's technology, today's opportunity, um, do you think, how has the whole, do you think the situation has changed, right? right? And is it changed for better or changed for worse? <laughs> Definitely changed for better. I think, I no longer feel that there's a ceiling cap in, in Singapore. Mm. I think really the, the, the glass ceiling, as you will, is really a mental glass ceiling. Mm. It's really the stories that you tell. If you tell yourself like, oh, Whatever it is, you can't grow because really with the internet, with the amount of digital businesses that are growing all the time, mm. right? Everything is, the, the playing field is level, mm. right? Especially now with all your blockchains, your smart AI and stuff like that. You really don't have to be, like a lot of people are growing despite the lack of opportunity, right? right? right. And we've seen all these people, they're raising millions of dollars yeah. over. So it really is, can you get on that opportunity? Do you guys have the guts to do it? And a lot of people do. It's just, they just back down, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. But I think it, just now you mentioned about, you know, broad change, AI and all this, right? Those are latest technology, yeah. which I think a lot of our freelancers, when they mentioned this, they were like, oh, no, no, I don't know any of yeah. this. I'm, I'm just a designer. I'm just a writer. 
I don't know about blockchain. I don't know about AI, right? So, what would you advise this, um, you know, freelancers? You know, in that sense, you know, where a lot of them currently they don't really require technology in that right. sense, right? Because as a writer, you know, or a designer, you you know, you don't really require to know so much outside your field. So, what would you advise this group of freelancers to do at this current time? But, so that initial skill set is also changing very quickly, right? So. Previously, like I said, as a photographer, maybe all I need to do is learn how to take pictures. Mm. Nowadays, a photographer needs to learn distribution as well, like mm. have a healthy social media following before they get hired, right? Yeah. Same thing as a writer, there's a lot of, you can either stay a writer and be very obsolete or you can open yourself up and yes, maybe uh, I, don't, I have no interest in AI, but blockchain, all of a sudden that's exciting, you know? Mm. If you grow, then that's how you find success mm. because if you don't grow, you're going to be stuck. Right? And unfortunately, the world is going to grow whether you like it or not. The world is expanding whether you like it or not. So it's just really up to each individual to be able to keep up with that. Yeah. Mm, to grow as well. Yeah. You stop at the first advice. What are the... Oh. <laughs> you can see oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. so, Second thing is I really ask, uh, ask, ask outrageously. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are very scared to ask for favours mm -hmm. or ask for certain things. And mm -hmm. once again, it's a lot of different stories, but... Um, I'm actually just reading a book called Ask Outrageously, I think. Mm. It's a lot of these big CEOs who actually ask, actually get something out of it. Yeah. Because if you don't even ask, you will never know. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But yeah. do you think is that a more Singaporean kind of trademark that we you know tend not to ask because we are worried about how other rejection. people will see rejection. us? Yeah, yeah. or rejections. Yeah, you know? rejection. Yes and no. I think mm. people from all everywhere around the globe are worried about rejection. Mm. I, like, you know, I, I don't like to be silly as well. I don't like to come across silly. But the thing is, if you don't ask, you're stuck at where you're always going to be. Mm. So really, the only person that has power to kind of break you out of that is really yourself. Yeah. Right? And you can either say, yes, you know what? I'm afraid to look silly. I'm just going to sit in my bubble. Mm. But then if you don't go anywhere, you only have yourself to blame. Mm. Right? So that really is one of the hardest things. But even so, sometimes for me as well, I catch myself in that. Sometimes I'm like, why didn't I ask? It was a very, I was nervous. I was afraid. I was like, this guy is way bigger than I am. I'm nervous. And I always kick myself for that, right? So now maybe because I'm more conscious, I try. I, don't, I wouldn't say I always 100% do it, but I know that is somewhere that I can improve. And I always, I'm, at least I'm more conscious about it. I think that's the start of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because really the second that you ask, at most, the answer is no. And you're really just back to square one, yeah. right? You're, you're, you don't lose anything. You're exactly back to where. But mm. if someone says yes, then all of a sudden you, you jump a level. That's true. Right? That, that's yeah. to me the biggest thing. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Okay. Final advice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Final advice. Don't be too comfortable in where you are at. Yeah. Because mm. I think more than ever, technology, your base skill set is always growing. Mm. Right? So if like what we said, as a photographer, as a writer, as an architect, like things constantly change. And if you insist on staying in your bubble, you, you, you'll you be left behind. Yeah. yeah. That's right. right. Thank you so much. Just one more question yeah. before we go. So if you can give one piece of advice to your younger self when you are just starting out, what would you say? <laughs> one piece of advice to my younger, younger self. Let me self. think about it, okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's okay. You can take your time. <laughs> Actually, a very good point to what you said. To me, I think that one lesson I would have given myself is take action despite fear. Mm. That's even better than being fearless. I think mm. everyone's fearless. Mm. Everyone has some fear at, mm. at some point of time. There's always something holding you back. But really the ones that succeed, the really only difference between the ones that succeed and the ones that don't are the ones that take action despite mm. that fear. Yeah. Really, that's what it is. Yeah. Right? So... I'm sure there were many times where I didn't take action. I lost a lot of opportunity because you know, I was just scared, right? I didn't want to look silly. I was blah, blah, blah. But I think now I'm a little bit more conscious. I'll still do it regardless. But when I was younger, who knows where I'll be if I had done all these different things. And we'll never know, right? But yeah. looking back, I think that's a, a very big thing as well. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. It is. Great. That's a great advice, everybody. <laughs> Take action, right? Okay. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you for the time. Thanks, so, Jay. Thanks, Yeah, we just want to do a bit of roundup. So, um, yeah. So, thank you for, for tuning in. Um, yeah, another episode for the Freelance another Exchange. Thing. So, subscribe to iTunes and leave a review. Uh, also, subscribe to our YouTube page and leave a comment because we want to hear what you think. Let us know the questions or the freelancer you want to hear from and follow us at Creatives at Work on Facebook page and Instagram. So join us next time for a brand new episode of Freelance Exchange. Until now, bye. see you. Bye. Bye, Kevin. Thank see you. Thanks see for you. having me. Bye. Thanks. Bye. bye. <laughs>